Hello, my name is Matthew Allen, and this is a presentation on genre and moves in academic writing. So the goals of this workshop are twofold. The first is to help you understand two concepts that are important to academic writing. The first one is genre, and the second is moves. So genre is a conceptual way to think about types of text or types of documents that are common in academic writing. And moves refers to the strategies that are usually based around language, the strategies that writers use when they're writing a text. So genre is basically types of text and moves are the strategic uses of language. The second objective is to introduce a language tool called the Academic Phrase Bank that I think is an excellent way to continue to practice and use these concepts of genre and moves. So before getting into the information, I wanna start with an activity. So I've collected four writing samples from published sources. The topics are somewhat similar, but the genres are different. So the goal of this activity is to ask yourself which of these samples are academic and which are not. So to make it a little bit interesting, um, there are two genres. One is the research article, the kind of article that would be published in a journal for academics, so researchers, scholars, or grad students to read. And the other genre is called news report. And these are science news articles or um, kind of general public is the audience. And the, the idea with these is that uh, science reporters would read academic articles, uh, find a story in those articles and publish that for a broader audience. So these would be published on uh, news websites uh, for a general audience, as opposed to a full scientific paper. So those are our two genres, academic research report and public news article. So I took introduction paragraphs from each of these so that we're working with similar parts of the paper. And in green, we have the title. The title of this is the exact amount of time you should work every day. And then we have the first part of this document. So pause the video and the presentation and read through this and try to figure out whether you think this is from an academic article or a news report. So at this point, you should have paused the video and read through this and thought about it. Uh, what you're going to want to look for is the uh, is, is patterns of moves, so uses of language uh, or, or features of language that identify this as being designed for a particular audience and a particular purpose. So the purpose of news reports is to inform a general audience about an interesting subject, and the purpose of an academic research report is to provide knowledge to a specialist audience. Okay, so this is the same text, but I have annotated it. So this is just my analysis of what I see going on. Uh, I do know for a fact that this is from a news report of, of research. Um, the question is, how do we know this? If we just had the language features, uh, how do we know this? So we can start with the title, uh, the exact amount of time you should work every day. We see this pronoun appear here, you. And then we see it appear throughout the paper, especially in the beginning. And this is not a common pronoun in academic writing. It's addressed to a general reader. Um, and I'll just point out some of the other pronouns. They're all referring to people um, for whatever that's worth. Um, we have a lot of narrative description, which I've highlighted in red. So it seems to be they're using this pronoun uh, and starting off with um, some description or storytelling. And the purpose of that in news articles is often to capture the attention of the reader. 
And then in green, or kind of this greenish color, I've highlighted some of the ways that the author is writing about the research or the researchers. And so some of the features we see are um, identifying, sorry, identifying the university. So some of the features that we see are identifying the name of the university, the name of the researcher, the title of the university. Um, and then there's actually a quote from this researcher saying he says, and that takes us to our last point that I saw, which is the verbs. Um, so things like reporting verb, what we call reporting verbs, like he says, these are not very common in academic research. Um, and the structure of this is to create a scenario where first this general person, kind of the reader, is doing this action, and then there's this story about this researcher doing this project and telling the some of the most interesting findings from this. We also see some verbs like hammer away at, feel stressed, um, that maybe it would not be as common in academic writing. So I encourage you to pause the video and, and uh, review my annotations. All right, the second article. This is again from the introduction. Um, the title, The Power of Kawaii, Japanese word, viewing cute images promotes a careful behavior and narrows attention of focus. Same activity, pause the video, read this carefully and decide whether it's from the introduction of a research article or a news article. All right, so hopefully you've identified some language features or some structural features of this paragraph that can help you make the decision, and I will now show you my annotations. So this is from a research article. Um, the title is quite information dense. The first part of the title is very short, four words, and, the, and then it's followed by a colon, and then it has a much longer, uh, very precise, description of the content or the main idea of this article. And then we can look through uh, some of the features. Interestingly, the pronouns rarely refer to people. They refer to things within the paragraph. So uh, relative pronouns or demonstrative pronouns are the most common, which and this. And then there is one uh, personal pronoun, we, and that in this case, clearly refers to the authors of the paper. And then I highlighted almost all of the text, or I colored almost all of the text in blue because I feel like it's talking about the focus of the study. So I, I like this article because it's about this very um, common everyday thing, which is cute things. Um, it's got this great opening line of five sentences, cute things are popular worldwide. It's just identifying a very broad topic of interest. And then we have this signposting language, um, which focuses the reader on a specific or a particular place which in the world, which is Japan. And then within that um, culture, they describe more detail. So it's it's a, what's sometimes called a funnel type paragraph. It starts very broad and very open. A general topic, cute things, and then a general location worldwide. Then it focuses and it gives a lot more detail. So it talks about anime and character goods and, and different things like Pokemon and Hello Kitty. Um, and then it gets into this very detailed analysis of language, this term kaiwai, its history, its translations, things like that. We also note that there is a interesting way to refer to research and researchers, which are just these numbers. Uh, the, actually, the, the pronoun we does refer to the authors, their researchers. But these numbers, what we would call footnotes or endnotes, footnotes ap appear at the bottom of a paper, and endnotes appear at the end. So this is the coding system. So we would expect if we followed this link to the end of the paper, we would find a full citation. For another research article, this is not a common feature of news articles. News articles often do not report on their sources. Um, the blue uh, highlights, again, these are signposting language. So in particular, however, and in the present paper. So I think of signpost as um, clues or signals that the writer is giving to the reader. 
And I compare it to someone driving their car down the road. There are signs like stop signs or speed limits or yield signs, lots of signs that direct the drivers to do a certain thing. So as they navigate the information, these, these little um, chunks or pieces or fr of language or, p or uh, phrases, like in the present paper, to help the reader make sense. And then um, I've underlined the verbs. So we see it's a mix of be verbs, like are, 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 is, and then there are um, some more content type verbs exported, changed to elicited. So words like elicited are more academic. They are um, less common in speech, less common in casual language than something like uh, we saw in the, the previous example. Um, I'll go back to that. So something like hammer away at, which is a very conversational type verb. Um, elicited, um, just like other some other nouns we could, or adjectives we could look at, like effective. Um, these are more academic. OK, the third example, same activity. Uh, read this. Decide whether it is uh, from a news article or an academic article. And then try to find textual evidence to support your decision. All right, so on the next slide, I will show my analysis, some of the things that I identified. This is from a news report. So interestingly, um, we see the same pattern that we saw in the academic article before this, a short uh, phrase and then a colon, and then some more information. Um, but I think I, we could have highlighted this first, this first line in red too. I think there's a lot of storytelling, um, kind of what we might call narrative description. So it's an interesting story that's going to connect to a lot of readers and make it feel like it's a a uh, thing that could happen to real people. That's an important part of narrative storytelling and that's in news genres. So I'll let you look through the rest of these. Uh, you can pause the video and analyze some of the different features that I identified. And then we have our final sample. A very long title. We have a colon again. This is a common pattern. And in this case, the shorter phrase actually comes after, or comes second, the role of communication technology use at home. So pause the video, read through this, same process, decide whether this is academic or news. And then here's my analysis. It is from a research article. We can think about the title. The tone, I would describe this as being very information dense. There's a lot of information. It's not necessarily easy for the reader to read. I have to understand what a lot of these terms mean. Um, I didn't see a lot of pronouns in this, um, but the, the blue text, we can see clearly they're focused on the object of the study. Um, they use parenthetical citations. So it's not footnotes or endnotes. It's a little bit different, but these are the names of authors in the year. This is another coding system, not a lot of signpost language. Um, we could look at the verbs, some B verbs, and then a few content words. So this is very information dense. Uh, lots of phrases, very long phrases that contain description and content due to advances in communication technologies over the last decade. That's a series of three uh, prepositional or three phrases due to advances in communication technologies over the last decade. We have a long subject, the US white color workforce, short verb, and then a long description. So that seems to be the basic pattern they're using in this. Interestingly, in their last sentence, uh, they provide a signpost. This seems to be a pattern we've already seen in the two in the previous academic article that the last sentence provides a signpost. So maybe it's a clue to the reader to help them transition to the next paragraph. Okay, so that's the 
first part of this, the activity, hopefully this helps you realize that you have a lot of latent knowledge about genre and moves. So latent knowledge means it's things you've already uh, learned about, but maybe you haven't uh, realized that you learned them or that you're aware of this knowledge. So the reason we can identify these patterns is because academic writing is full of conventions. Uh, these are common uses of language, common patterns that many people follow or adhere to or are aware of. So the question is, how can you use them? So if we want to introduce a theory, we can, uh, some theory, we can have three concepts. One is genre. So part of what we're doing is a genre analysis. We're looking at news articles versus academic articles, the introductions. And this is an empirical research method. And so we're actually looking at evidence. We're not asking people or thinking about it. We're looking at data. In this case, it's writing samples. We want to see if we can find some patterns, things like pronouns, verbs, uh, use of signposting language. And so these are what we might call moves. These are communicative or logical structures. They're, they're uses of language to do things. Uh, to make the reader uh, understand text or content a certain way. Um, and the last thing we can call phraseology or chunks of language. Chunks is just kind of an informal term for phrases or, or uh, sets of words and that in function as a unit. So for example, in particular is a chunk or a phrase or a unit in this paper. That would be a phrase that we can treat as a chunk. So. We don't analyze it or break it into parts. We just use it as a, as a phrase or a big piece that we could use in lots of different papers. So if we take these three concepts, we can apply them to this thing called the Academic Phrase Bank, which is a website. You can find it just by searching for Academic Phrase Bank. So we can see uh, some features of genre analysis in the top here. This is the top toolbar of the website. So what they've done is they've analyzed many dissertations and research articles based on a very common uh, set of sections of the paper. Um, so most of these papers do all of these things, or most of these things. They introduce work, they refer to sources, they describe the methods they use in their study, they describe their, they report on the results of their study, then they discuss the findings, and then they write their conclusions. So talking about implications or interpretations. Uh, on the left-hand side, we could see the different moves that are common. There are also moves we can also call general language functions. So if this is kind of the form of the paper, the form of the paper follows this, starts with an introduction and describes the methods. This is sometimes known as IMRAD, Introduction, Methods, Results, Analysis, Discussion. That's the form of the paper. Then this is a lot about functions. So sometimes writers are critical. Sometimes they're cautious. Sometimes they classify and list. Sometimes they compare and contrast. These are different things we might do. Uh, many writers give examples. It helps the reader understand what the writer is thinking. Uh, signaling transitions. This is a way of signposting. It helps the writer uh, indicate to the reader that they're changing ideas, changing directions, or moving on to a new section. And then under each one of these, if we click on these, so this, this one right here, I've clicked on being critical. There's some guidance here. You can pause the video and read this about what it means to be critical and why this is common in academic writing. And then there are even more specific moves within, more specific functions within this idea of being critical. So that's the purple text here. So the first one, introducing questions, problems, limitations about a theory or an argument. How do you do that with language? What are the chunks or the pieces or the phrases of language? Well, based on their database, their sample size, or sorry, their sample of dissertations and articles, they've pulled out lots of templates that you can use. So these are just patterns of language that seem to be common and that are probably going to be helpful to writers. So you can do the same activity. Um, they just done a lot of the work for you, um, but you can do the same type of analysis as you're reading. You can think to yourself, what is the move or the function that this writer is doing? And then what is the language that they're using to do it? And a lot of the times you will find phrases that are uh, recycled or reused across many different papers. <clears throat> 
So a nice way to practice activity is not just an introduction, but an abstracts, because abstracts are self-contained capsule descriptions of a paper. So they're a one paragraph overview of an entire paper. And so we would expect to see lots of different um, phrases and moves within this very uh, particular genre. Gen abstract is a is genre of its, of its own. So we would expect to see some introduction, maybe some methodology, some analysis, some results, some discussion. So if you'd like to do this, here is an example of an abstract that I've found on this thing called Epiphany Learning. You take a moment to pause the video, read it, and then I will provide an analysis of my own. So I've analyzed this specifically in terms of phrases and moves. So the phrases are underlined, and then the, the moves are listed in the, in the column to the left, so these bullet points. So I've left the phrases in the full black color text, and the content is in the gray. And the idea here is that um, the phrases are really the language that any general writer can reuse. So I'm not going to talk about reinforcement learning in my field, and not many uh, researchers will unless you study this. But it's a pretty small study area. Um, but, but all of us um, at some point talk about models, or we, we need to review the literature. Um, we might think about uh, some examples in some cases. Uh, and then we might want to point to limitations. So this is uh, the move here is identifying problems or limitations. Um, here's a, once you have a limitation, we often move or, or uh, make the strategy of proposing a solution. So that's the move, propose the solution, and then we can just use that same language we propose. Uh, I think in the experiment, that's a move to tell the reader, hey, I'm going to explain my methodology now. We find that. So what are they doing? They're presenting their findings. And then the last move that I see, our findings suggest they're, they're talking about significance or interpreting their findings. So this is what you might call a phrase and move analysis, really focused on the language. I think if you do this in almost any abstract, uh, you'll find that there is some of this um, phraseology or these chunks of language. And then there's hopefully the majority of it is content. If, if there's all um, phraseology, then there, there's no, there's no um, content. We're just reading a lot of function language and that's not very interesting or, or helpful. Because of course, the main purpose of academic writing is to communicate knowledge. Okay, so how could you use this information? Hopefully this makes sense. How could you use this? Um, first, you need to like make sure it makes sense to you so you could rewatch this video. There are a lot of resources online about moves, uh, functions, and genre. Um, I think this approach helps you solve some challenges. So it can give you a language that you can use in your head to analyze uh, text that you read or to structure, organize, and outline text that you're writing. It also helps you talk to other writers or to maybe to your advisor, editors, um, other academic writers about your text. So if a professor asks a student to write a reflection paper, that's a genre, and there are particular moves and functions that a, a writer needs to use in a reflection. Um, one of the, the common moves in a reflection paper is to use a lot of personal pronouns. A reflection is like looking in the mirror and analyzing uh, one, one's life or one's um, recent experiences. So one would expect a lot of um, personal pronouns, I, me, my, we, our. We would expect a lot of um, use of different verb tenses, looking at the past tense, maybe the future tense as well, uh, and the present tense. So we would expect uh, different uh, verb tenses to be used. And this would show that the writer is reflecting because they're thinking about uh, different time periods and how their, maybe their thinking has changed or how they've grown, developed. Um, 
other genres. So maybe you're asked to write a, a literature review. In a literature review, in that is genre. We would not expect many personal pronouns, especially pronouns that refer to the writer, because unlike a reflection where you're looking at yourself, a literature review, you're looking outward at the literature. And so you, you, if you use pronouns, they would refer to the authors of the papers, generally, of other papers. Um, and there would be specific um, genre features that we would expect. You would have to figure out an organizational pattern. So it could be by um, chronology. You might do a historical literature review. Um, in that case, you would use different phrases um, to indicate the passage of time, first, second, third, uh, initially, later on, subsequently, more recently. Those are, those are signposts or phrases that the writers use to indicate the passage of time. Um, okay. What, the last question on this slide, what challenges does this approach create? Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just a learning curve. It's, it's somewhat new to you. Um, and so you might have to think about it for a while until it makes sense. Um, the other challenge sometimes this creates is once you realize that there are resources like the academic phrase bank available, um, then you uh, can spend a lot of time just looking at the options instead of doing your own writing. So maybe it's a little distracting. One of the other challenges that comes up is students often ask about plagiarism versus creative uses of language. So is it plagiarizing to use phrases or chunks of language from other papers? Um, and this is a really important question. So to answer that, I want to go back to this slide, the previous slide, and show that I think this pattern is important. Most of the language should be content language. But there is intentional or what we might say strategic use of phraseology or moves. Um, and that's the underlined text here. So I think this, this, this kind of underlined text, these phrases, are the kinds of language that um, people are not going to consider plagiarism or cheating or copying. This is more about recycling. Um, and the reason this is important is because these are conventions we expect as readers to find some repetition of patterns that we're, we're used to. Uh, it helps us identify different genres, for example, and helps us uh, process the information in a way that is familiar to us. Because the, the most important part of this paper, in this particular case, is about reinforcement learning and epiphanies. So we want to read something new on this topic, but it helps the reader a lot if the language structure is familiar. And that's what the phrases and moves can, can help us do. So I'll end this presentation with, with some strategies about how you can apply this. Um, I think starting small, choosing one paragraph from a paper that you're working on is a good place. Maybe the first or the last paragraph. These are um, often full, full of um, moves and strategies to introduce or to close a paper. Then you could go to the relevant section or the sections of the academic phrase bank. And one way to do this is to force yourself to revise each sentence using a template. And so the question I like to ask when you're doing this type of very careful work is why this now or why that now? So why that template? Because each template should go to a specific move. Why that now? So for the first sentence of your paper, what is it that you want to say in the first sentence? In the second sentence, what is it you want to say and how are you going to say that? Um, and so forth. So that question of why that now, why that language structure, why that phrase, why that verb tense. And so templates can help you think very deliberately about the exact moves you're going to make. Are you going to be critical to start off or are you going to be cautious? Um, those are moves. And then you can look at particular phrases to be critical or to be cautious. And then a caveat or a warning, just a fair warning, is to say, and everybody knows this who works on this, is you have to be creative and adapt these. So rarely can you copy a phrase and just stick it in your paper without changing it a little bit. So like any form of practice, doing this on a regular schedule, um, this is basically exercise for writing skills. 